Welcome to Founder Stories. I'm Mike Abbott. With me today, today is Nate Blacharsik from Airbnb. Welcome, Nate. Thank you, Mike. It's good to have you. Well, first, tell us a little bit about Airbnb. Sure. Uh, Airbnb, we've made it just as easy to book someone's home as a hotel. Uh, and today, on our open marketplace, we have 300,000 properties mm-hmm. around the world, 192 countries, 35,000 different cities. Uh, why we've been so successful is we're ultimately providing an experience. And it's not just uh, the, the roof over your head, um, but it's meeting the host and it's being exposed to a different neighborhood that makes you feel like you're really in San Francisco. Hmm. And give us a, a sense of size, like how big is the company? Well, uh, there's different ways to look at this, but we have 60 engineers today. We have about 220 people in San Francisco uh, and then a few hundred more abroad doing customer support and, and other uh, functions. Okay. We'll come back to the size here in a bit. I, one of the things that's striking to me about the company that we were just talking about is you know, your co-founders, Joe and Brian, are designers, yeah. and, and you're an engineer. And a lot of times startups have either you know, missing one of those or they hire that later. I'd love to hear from you, like, what have you found to be like, the pros and cons of, of having that, that kind of match from the beginning? Yeah, I know. It's pretty unusual. And I actually yeah. attribute a lot of our success to that combination. Um, Listen, we, we see things very differently because mm-hmm. of our backgrounds, um, and we've discovered that's an asset. Uh, sometimes it takes a little longer to um, reconcile our perspectives, but what we found is if we take the time to do that, we can come up with a superior solution, one that takes into account both, uh, both points of view. Um, and when we've scaled the team, we've really looked for people um, from both those perspectives and try to create an environment where people can kind of come together to collaborate um, and basically recreate this founder DNA that's been, uh, been so successful. Have you seen like, any challenges though? Or like, I mean, at some point you kind of have to break ties and design obviously wants to push, push the envelope on the experience. Mm-hmm. Engineering wants to deliver on that, but also make sure it runs. Yeah. I mean, have you run into those challenges? Well, I think when we approach problems, we start with the and versus the or. I mean, it's very mm-hmm. easy to jump mm-hmm. to immediately doing the trade-off mm-hmm. discussion, mm-hmm. Um, but we really try to first understand both perspectives fully and really challenge ourselves to how can we do both things. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, sometimes you do have to make a little bit of a trade-off, um, but not before we fully explore the options. I think um, too many times you see people shortcutting the solution. I mean, that's mm-hmm. a very kind of engineering mindset mm-hmm. to just kind of shortcut the process for speed. Um, and there's a time and place for that, but you don't want to miss out on the creativity too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I attribute a lot of our success to to that. I mean, the three founders, I think if any one of us weren't a part of this company, we wouldn't have gotten as far. Hmm. So you're at 60 today in engineering. And I remember when we first met about a year and a half ago, it was like 10. Yeah. So you've a lot, a lot of growth. Tell us a little bit about that, like what you've kind of learned in, in that type of growth, uh, just on the engineering time, and even as a company uh, yeah. in that time frame. Yeah, well, we've always been very cautious with our hiring, uh, not just because we're looking for exceptionally talented uh, engineers, but also because culture uh, is so important to us. And so uh, that's a difficult intersection of people. And so as a result, even though we've been doing a lot of business for a long time, and today like the numbers are so huge, and 60 is not nearly enough to support that, um, you know, we've always been a little bit behind the curve in the hiring. But the, uh, the, the benefit of that has been that each person who comes in has a lot of impact. And when you have fewer people taking a lot of responsibility, you get more consistency. Um, and you actually you have more efficiency, right? Because the bigger the team gets, mm-hmm. um, sometimes there's more overhead as well. So right now, we're, we're still in this sweet spot of having a really big problem um, and yet, people are, are still taking individual ownerships for parts of the product. Mm-hmm. So th- those 60 people are split between 17 different uh, working groups. And so each team has anywhere from like one to three people. Um, so there's still real kind of accountability and really good ownership of what's being built. I'd be curious to hear, I mean, with that, you know, designer engineers, like the founders of the company, like how do the products and services get built? Yeah. At Airbnb. Yeah. Well, we have this concept of one product team, and it's mm-hmm. composed of uh, the engineers and the designers uh, and some of the product managers. And so, depending on what part of the product we're working on, you'll have some combination of these people involved um, from start to finish, which I think is an important distinction. It's not that um, design or product kind of comes up with a spec and throws it over the wall. It's a collaborative process um, that starts with all three parties involved and ends with all three parties involved. Um, and they all work in the same space. So there's one giant room, 
and uh, you have designers sitting next to engineers. And regardless of what team you're on, the teams might be mixed up too. So we really try to stress that there are no silos. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So uh, as you kind of grew from 10 to 60 and the, and the company like, as large grew that quickly, um, what kind of tools did you build or I mean, look, look, reflecting back on that, what would you do differently or what work to be and share with our audience? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the way you build product certainly changes over time. I think initially you're, you're optimizing for like product market fit and just figuring out mm -hmm. what's going to stick. And so you want to move really fast. That's what you're optimizing for. Uh, later on in a company's life, you're optimizing for scale. You figured it out and you need to scale it. And that's a different kind of uh, engineering and maybe product structure. We're kind of in this interesting place in the middle, right, where we've definitely found fit and uh, we are transitioning to more scale. Um, I think one of the things that have benefited us is by having a smaller team earlier on. I mean, actually, I was the only engineer for one year after we launched uh, hmm. the product. And so a lot of the core functionality I built, and it's built very consistently, um, and although it was built fast, uh, it was also built in a very modular way, right? And so what we've done over time is we've basically replaced certain vertical components like search um, and turned it into a separate service and maybe it's in Java. Um, that's one example. Another thing we've had to do is um, create a better deploy process because you have more and more people pushing code. We let our engineers push at any point throughout the day. So you got 60 people mm -hmm. pushing code uh, and we've had to make sure that there aren't collisions when code's going out. It takes a while to update all the machines. Uh, you need a safety net with the testing, uh, and then you need really good instrumentation of metrics to know, okay, I just pushed some code. Did that change any of the pro performance metrics or mm -hmm. business metrics? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of tooling around that hmm. so that we can continue to push just as we did two kind of years keep ago. Keep that same pace, but yeah. do it a little more confidently. Yeah, exactly. Um, so one of the things that, that you've done and the company's done, which I think has been really effective, is setting up these tech talks. Yeah. I'd love to hear about like what you know, drove you to go create those and, and what have you kind of learned from those? Yeah, well, it's obvious that there's a really passionate community here, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's just so many people involved in this. So there's no doubt that um, there's an audience for this. I think what we've really tried to do is um, differentiate our tech talks because I think th there are a lot of tech talks out mm -hmm. there. It's not a new idea. So what has made our tech talk so popular? I think it's the same thing that makes our, our product so popular or anything else is, you know, we, we don't just think about providing the utility, but we think about the full experience of this, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, when you come over for one of our tech talks, uh, we have Chef Sam and his team uh, making like, you know, original creations uh, for people. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's sometimes uh, mood lighting. Uh, it, there's a whole vibe going mm -hmm. on uh, that I think people, people really enjoy because you know, everyone's time is precious, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not just about providing the, the content of the meeting, which you know, we have a high bar for, um, but it's also making sure it's fun um, for people to network, et cetera. Yeah, it seems like it's, they've worked really well. I'm sure good for recruiting too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so popular. So we do the engineering ones every two weeks, and mm -hmm. then we actually now have design ones every other week, too, like Fantastic. on the off weeks. And uh, the data team wants to have their own series, so we're trying to find a new night for mm -hmm. them. The weekends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so recently I read that you brought on a VP of engineering. Yeah, Mike Curtis. And uh, I'd love to hear about, for you, as you, know, that you were the solo engineer for a year, and you've been there as the team has grown, now you brought someone in. How does that transition bring someone in and kind of delegating a lot of these things that you've historically done to, to someone else? Yeah, it's gone really smoothly and it's been an awesome experience. Uh, finding Mike uh, was a long process. Uh, it took over a year. Uh, you know, it's painful to, to have an open rec for that long and to have to mm -hmm. do that many interviews. But I have to say uh, it was worth taking that time to find the perfect uh, person for mm -hmm. us. Uh, Mike's just been full of energy. He's been like a perfect fit with the other leaders in the company. Uh, the team has been like incredibly jazzed uh, about having him here. And, um, you know, what's great is that, you know, Mike has seen a team operate at a different scale. Uh, so there's Facebook scale where he led the growth team there, which is a team of about 60 or 75 right now. Um, and he's also been at Yahoo before that with a team of like 200. Mm -hmm. So he's d seen different life cycles. And from that, he's kind of, he has a good sense for where we need to go mm -hmm. um, while still being excited to be kind of at the stage where we're at, which mm -hmm. is uh, maybe a lot more mm -hmm. agile. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of advice though can you give to another technical founder who, you know, he or she brings in that leader mm -hmm. And you've seen work, I yeah. Because that that you know it's great that after a year you found him and it sounds like that's going well. But 
Yeah, sometimes it doesn't always work out. So I'd love to, what kind of counsel can you provide? Yeah, well, because I met with so many people, we had to get really organized about how do we compare, you know, 50 mm. candidates, right? And so we spent a lot of time really writing out the spec um, and getting alignment amongst those who are part of the process um, and really thinking about, you know, how do we probe this, this one aspect of the criteria. So I'd be just really thoughtful about that, take the time to do that. Um, just don't do a bunch of interviews or meet and greets. Um, I would say uh, don't settle. I mean, this, this person is a permanent member and is responsible for one of your most important assets, which is the engineering team. You want to take the time, and even if it takes an extra year, that's, mm -hmm. that's fine. Um, I would say uh, spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, too, right? You know, go through your current problems. See how they think about it. Mm -hmm. um, make sure that this is someone you're going to have a blast working with every day. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, look where they come from. You know, what was culture like there? Do you think that's an organization where you can learn some stuff from? Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you're hiring this person because they've seen some things, right? Like they have more experience. Mm -hmm. uh, well, where did they get that experience from? Is it from a place where you think there's a lot of overlap with whom you want to become mm -hmm. um, or not? Mm -hmm. Well, Nate, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for, for coming over today. Uh, and thank you all for watching Founder Stories.